This is Tacoma from Fulbright. So Tacoma is a first-person exploration game. Uh, it's what I it's what I call a mystery house game. Uh, you go into the mystery house and you piece together the mystery. Yeah, it's not not a great term. Anyway, in Tacoma you go to Tacoma, the space station. Um, something has gone wrong with the station's AI, and you're up there to fix it. Or more specifically, you're up there to recover the AI. Uh, and you go through the various habitats and compartments and modules of the Tacoma Space Station. And while there, you're meant to just recover the AI, but it takes a while for you to download it or whatever the hell it is you're doing. And you can explore the space station and recover some of the logs from the different people. See what happened in the last week or last couple of days before whatever it was went wrong on the station. And what happened to them? And where are they now? And why isn't there anybody on the station? You know, and what went wrong? So in that way, it's very similar to Fulbright's previous game, which is uh, Gone Home, which had a similar mystery house uh, set up, although it was an actual house this time, in that you went into the house, and people were supposed to be there, but they weren't there, and you don't know why, so you go about the different rooms of the house trying to find out, you know, what happened. And Tacoma is basically the same. The only real big difference for Tacoma is, one, the change of scenery, obviously you're in space, but also the story is played back to you by means of an AR simulation, as opposed to Gone Home, which was uh, text and voiceover and tapes and things like that. So there's a bit more production value in it, but not a huge amount, really. I mean, the AR character models are still very simplistic. Still, they get the story across. The voice performance is very good. You know, there are some really interesting character stories and character arcs going on in the background, and it is fun to kind of piece together the different scenes and try to, you know, have it in your own head. Oh, I wonder if that's why this happened, or I wonder, are they over here this time now, or something like that. But if you've played these kind of exploration games before, you kind of know what you're getting. Tacoma is a good version of one of them, of a walking simulator, if you like. Even though you're in space, you're kind of zero-g floating. Anyway, the Tacoma came out last year on uh, Windows PC and Xbox. Uh, so this is its PlayStation 4 debut. So if you're wondering if you've seen it before and why I'm only playing it now, that's why. There are some technical problems with the game as well. It just it stutters a little bit on area change, and you can have some frame rate drops when you're entering and exiting areas. But that's about it. Otherwise, it's it's a said it's all already a very simple game, so there's not a whole lot for it to get hung up on. But if you like your mysteries and you like space, I guess you probably like Tacoma. I did. Minnie, I'm headed in. Talk to you when I'm back. Don't let anybody scan the ship while I'm gone. Okay. Okay. This is Bloodstained Curse of the Moon from Inti Creates. So this game was announced and then released in a very short amount of time. Uh, this game serves as a prologue to Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which is a big Kickstarter project from Koji Igarashi. He's the uh, big mastermind behind Igavania-style Castlevania games. So Curse of the Moon, as you can probably tell, is a kind of retro, uh, old NES design Castlevania-type game. And it's just as hard as those kind of Castlevanias, so, so we're talking kind of pre-Symphony, the, the very old Castlevania game. You play as four characters. You play as Zangetsu, who's a samurai, and he's the first character you play with. You play as Miriam, as a girl who uses a whip. Miriam will be the main character of Ritual of the Night, and can have many weapons within that game, but in this game, she's uh, confined to just a whip. And you have a third character as an alchemist, whose name I forget, <laughs> because I never use him. And then you have Jebel, or Gibel, or Jabel, I don't know, don't know how you pronounce his name. And he's pretty much Dracula. Um, so they're not going too far from Castlevania. So the game's only a tenor, uh, and is really meant to kind of promote Ritual of the Night more than anything else. So it's pretty short, but it's also pretty hard. You know, uh, going back to those old Castlevania games, they're kind of tough, and this is also pretty tough. But it serves as decent promotion uh, for Ritual of the Night. You should really be paying attention to that game, because I know I am. I'm dying to play it. The game appears to finish at the first stage of Ritual of the Night. Oh, I'm going to assume it's the first stage. It was the demo stage. It was the galleon. It was a ship. 
and Curse of the Moon appears to finish there. I say appears to finish there because I haven't actually finished it. I'm, I'm on what I believe is the last level, but it's uh, still pretty tough. Anyway, it's only a tenner. Give it a lash. It's available on basically everything, <laughs> from what I can tell. This is Detroit Become Human, the latest uh, interactive drama from David Cage and Quantic Dream. This follows the story of three androids, Connor, uh, Marcus and Kara, as they uh, become human, I guess, in Detroit. So the background for the game is androids are a kind of vital part of, of human day-to-day -day life. We use them to do menial tasks, you know, we send them to the shops to get us stuff, we have them clean our houses, we have them take care of our children, you know, whatever. They do everything. And suddenly, some androids are kind of pushing back against it and maybe it's a glitch in their programming or maybe it's something more. Maybe they're become human, I don't know. Anyway, th that's the general gist of the story. Uh, it's set against the backdrop of the kind of um, civil rights and slavery issues of the US. Uh, a bit heavy-handed with the slavery allegory, to be fair. And to be honest, uh, the X-Men did a much better job of it. So you play the three different androids. You play Connor, who is an android detective, I guess is probably the best way to put it. And he hunts down deviant androids. So these androids who have a glitch, or who are becoming human, whatever way you want to put it. You play as Kara, who is kind of what the kind of default android position is, in that she's kind of a house, a house minder and a child minder sort of thing. And you play as Marcus, who starts the game off kind of taking care of an uh, elderly gentleman who's really nice to him, you know, and he's the way, you know, the human-android relationship should be, I guess, if you want for it that way. And events happen that I'm not going to talk about because this is a heavily narratively driven game, so I'm not going to do any of the spoilers, but let's just say things happen and it leads to this whole uh, civil rights issue with the androids. So the gameplay-wise, it plays very similar to uh, previous Quantic Dream games, you know, Heavy Rain, Fahrenheit, Beyond Two Souls, you use the right analog stick gestures to interact with things in the environment. There's quick time events, there's hold the buttons, there's press the buttons, there's mash the buttons, there's hold various buttons in particular configurations and so on. Production values have had a, obviously a massive jump. I mean, yes, it's, it's going from Beyond Two Souls would have been a PS3 game, so going to a PS4 is already a huge jump. But clearly they got a lot more money for this game. Uh, there's some fantastic technology at work here. The, the performance capture is just so good. And the performances themselves are also you know, very impressive. And it's got Clancy Brown in it. I love Clancy Brown. Uh, if you don't know, he plays Lex Luthor in the Superman and Justice League animated cartoons from when I was young anyway. I don't know who plays him now. So I didn't really like Beyond Two Souls all that much. Uh, Heavy Rain. Well, I kind of enjoy playing it, it does have a lot of story problems. That's not to say that Detroit doesn't have story problems, but they're not as bad. They're not, they don't massively undermine the plot like Heavy Rain did, um, but it does still have kind of dangling plot threads and there are, you will still come across some weird issues if you replay the game earlier scenes. When you know what happens later on, you're like, mm, these kind of don't really match up anymore, you know? It's kind of the old quantic dream problem of hoping you don't play the game a second time because then you start to see the seams. But it's much, I, I'd say it's probably their best one at this point. I think it's really, I think it was really good. I enjoyed it. There's not a whole lot I can talk to you about because it's so story-wise, but I do feel like they focused a bit too much on the idea of the android being human. Like whatever it was, this, this glitch in their system turned them into humans. They started acting like humans emotions-wise and 
rather than taking the idea of the the human complex or the human condition and putting it onto androids and how and exploring that kind of thing they don't really go into the existentialism and the things which i kind of hope they would have but yeah it's a fun game there's there's a, uh, a lot of replay value in it if you kind of ignore the sort of plot thread issues the plot hole issues the game in, in this case adds a, a flow chart at the end of every scene so you can see you know the actions you took in that scene and how they play into other actions later on in the scene and other actions later on in the whole story uh, and you can also see locked actions uh, actions you didn't take or avoided taking in some cases and how they play in and replaying those scenes uh, it allows you to kind of jump around the scene uh, you can jump into various checkpoints from within it and you can opt to save those changes and overwrite your old flowchart or just ignore it and just you know play around in the scene see what see what happens that's good for replay value uh, it's good for like completionists and trophy hunters and that so i do appreciate that end of thing because that's probably what i'll be doing now now that i've finished it i'll give it a bit of a break play something else then come back to it and just you know see what i missed You know what? I'll buy you one for the road. What do you say? Bartender, the same again, please. See that, Jim? Wonders of technology. Make it a double. This is Cultist Simulator. This is a game from Weather Factory. This was a Kickstarter project. Uh, it was announced late last year. It's had a pretty good turnaround for as far as Kickstarter game projects go. It's probably not surprising because what you're seeing on the screen is pretty much all you'll see for the whole game. This is a card game. Stay with me. I know you want to skip off, but stay with me for a minute. It's set early 20th century uh, and is a kind of occult investigation slash survival slash resource management card game. Stay here. So the gist of the game uh, it's a cultist simulator, so you are simulating a cult or a secret society if you prefer. And you have particular goals for your secret society, it might be enlightenment or power or immortality or whatever. And you study the mystic arts and you found your cult and you recruit people, you summon Cthulhu monsters from the deep or from wherever, from the void, depending on where you're going. And you dream about the, the lore and you enter dreamland the demances investigate there and you discover even more lore but all the while you have to pay your bills you have to go to work you have to keep the authorities at bay you have to keep your sanity at bay at bay no you have to keep your sanity you have to keep your dread at bay and not get overly fascinated with your things as well so you have to keep a kind of healthy uh, skepticism about what you're doing too so you have all these things at play all at once and you just try to keep them all ticking over while progressing your knowledge, while progressing your cult, your influence, always going towards whatever the main goal of the cult is, as I said, power or enlightenment or whatever, it's given to you at the start of the game. Uh, you're not gonna get any of that because you're probably gonna die straight off. Uh, as the first character you're forced to play as, uh, he doesn't start with too many great traits. Uh, his job is pretty shit. Uh, he doesn't really make enough money and it's far too easy for him to just uh, die from hunger straight away. But you get other characters that you can play as. You can play as a doctor. You can play as a wealthy man of... Uh, I can't remember the, the word they use, but he's a wealthy fop, more or less. Uh, or you can play as a detective of the Suppression Bureau, who are more or less the bad guys or the police for these uh, cult guys. Uh, if you're not playing as a Suppression Bureau member, you're typically trying to avoid notoriety with them. So there's a couple of different ways your game can end. You can end up behind bars, or you can die of hunger, or you can uh, go insane. 
and I've had all of them. <laughs> and I haven't actually managed to finish it. The game has no tutorial, uh, so it's encouraging you to experiment using cards with particular uh, actions. So you'll use your job card on the work verb, so that means go to work. Or you'll use a, a passion card on the work card and instead you will try to paint. Or you'll use a lore card with the study verb and that means you'll try to study a piece of lore. Or you'll use a location with the explorer verb so you'll go to that location and so on. There's lots of different combinations. Combinations yield different results. Sometimes you don't always get the same result. So it's a very much healthy experimentation while also trying not to die. Uh, it is a lot of fun, but it's definitely daunting, uh, particularly if you're just jumping into it and going, what am I supposed to do? There's really no overall direction other than you must gain enlightenment or you must gain power or whatever it is you're looking for. So yeah, if I ever actually manage to finish a round, <laughs> I might have different things to say about the game, but at the moment I'm intrigued and a little bit overwhelmed. This is Forgotten Anne, and it is indeed spelt that way. Produced from the Square Enix Collective, which is kind of Square Enix's uh, incubator for smaller games. This is a 2D puzzle platformer game. It's just got beautiful art uh, and animation. Uh, it's just really nice to look at, just playing the game. It's just really, everything just looks so good. So the background for the game is you are playing Anne, uh, who is an enforcer in this world uh, where forgotten items uh, disappear to. So the way they characterize it is if, uh, you know, you lose a sock in in your washing machine, you know, you don't know where it went, this is where it went. Uh, you know, you lose a suitcase in travel, this is where the suitcase went. You know, you put, a, you put a, an old TV up in the attic and you kind of forget about it, this is where it ended up going. So a bit metaphysics, if you like. And the plot of the game is there's these forgotlings, which are the kind of uh, anthropomorphized forgotten items, you know, socks that can talk, basically, uh, are not happy with their current, you know, setup with the current predicament, and they're rising up for, you know, better, better treatment and better opportunities and so on. And as the enforcer, uh, it's your job to kind of figure out what's going on here. You know, there's random explosions happening, and there's rebels, and you know, whose side is is correct. And you do this by talking to lampposts and teddy bears and shoes <laughs> and various other things that can talk back with funny accents and humorous dialogue. You know, there's a lot of fun characters in it. Uh, the dialogue is, for the most part, quite humorous. It's not laugh out loud funny, but you know, you get a bit of a chuckle out of it. Gameplay is just solving puzzles. They're fairly, they're fairly basic. Nothing really physics based. It's all to do with your kind of this arca thing that you have on your hand that kind of moves energy around the environment and the puzzles for the most part are based around just flipping switches or redirecting energy flow and things like that. They're not super taxing but it is a joy to kind of just walk around in the environment uh, it's just because it just looks so nice it just looks like you're playing a cartoon it's great but because of the, the kind of heavy art and animation uh, the game can feel a little bit stiff to move around and doesn't necessarily always stop in the places you want her to or she might you know finish off a couple of cycles of her run animation before she'll start moving in a different direction just things like that it doesn't really impact the game hugely but you do notice it over time the game does have a morality system and a choices system so uh, certain choices you make earlier in the game can impact later opportunities and later scenes so there's some good replay value there to try and you know try some new things the next time you play the game it's a bit of fun as I said, there's fun characters, uh, humorous dialogue, um, and the game's plot does get a little bit deeper and a little bit more grim as the game goes on. You know, it goes some interesting places. Uh, but I'm playing this mostly because it just looks really nice to play. <laughs> Always appreciate good art.
Where's Strutt? He's at the workshop. He's in one of his moods today. Thanks. Now stop kicking those. But it's all I can do. Don't tell Strutt to kick the pipes. So that was Foley's Games for May 2018. Detroit Become Human was actually a decent David Cage game for a change. Forgotten Anne has some really nice art. It's really nice to just walk around and play. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, bit of a surprise. Wasn't even expecting that game, but happy with it. Cult of Simulator, I still have no idea what's going on in the game, so... I think I'm having fun with it, but I don't know. It's a little bit frustrating, because I just keep dying. And Tacoma, uh, those kind of exploration mystery things are always a, a safe bet for me. Coming up next month on the channel, E3 is happening the end of this week. Assuming I get this video out before E3 happens, otherwise E3 has already happened. I Last year I did a kind of roundup highlights video for E3 events. I'm looking to do something similar this year, but probably not the highlight end of things. I'll probably just comment over the live stream itself. Uh, mostly because editing it was a pain in the ass. So look forward to them, we've got press conferences from EA, Ubisoft, Bethesda, Square Enix, and then the platform holders themselves, Microsoft, Sony, uh, Nintendo. Hopefully there'll be something interesting coming out of them. Games for next month though, Agony. I mean, I don't know how long I've been waiting for this now. There was some, some logistics issue getting keys for a Kickstarter backer, so I still haven't got my key. I've seen some reviews for the game coming out already and it's not getting great scores, it's actually getting some fairly low scores, so that's a bit of a downer, to be honest. Uh, I'll wait until I've played it myself just to get my own verdict on it, but yeah, I'm not holding out too well for that. One game next month, uh, Vampire, or Vampire, depending on how you want to pronounce it, I'd say Peer because there's no E at the end, from Don't Nod Games, they're the people behind Life is Strange. Really looking forward to this. I've been, you know, dying to play a kind of stealthy vampire game for ages, and I just haven't found a decent one since, like, Vampire the Masquerade. Um, so yeah, I'm really hoping this turns out good. Elsewhere on the channel, the Prince of Persia LP is complete, finally. Uh, so the whole thing is there now, 30 parts. It comprises the main game and the epilogue DLC. It's about an hour and a half, two hours extra content on at the end. Just wraps up the story a little bit. There's a commentary version and no commentary version, so if you don't like my voice or you just don't want to listen to my shitty jokes all the way through it, that's fair enough. There's a no commentary version there, knock yourself out. I will be thinking about doing a new LP, or not thinking about it, but I will be doing a new LP. Tomb Raider is still ongoing. I'll be waiting until E3 is over before I decide which LP it will be. Uh, depending on the news that comes out, I might want to do something as a run-up for a later release in the year. Or I might just pull something out of the ether and just do a game on that instead. Looking f looking towards the next few months, uh, it's summertime. And as those of you who are video game enthusiasts will know, summertime is a bad game for... Bad game? Yeah, bad time even for games. Uh, the summer drought will be upon us soon. I'm looking at my own calendar for release dates and there's very little. Uh, that I can see, there's Vampire, Vampire, and that's it until like September, so uh, we might be pulling out of the backlog here a lot for the next few months, unless E3 has something interesting up its sleeve. Otherwise, let me know what you thought of this month's video, any games that I actually don't know about that are coming up in summer that I should take a look at. Uh, let me know your predictions for E3 or anything like that. Keep an eye on the channel, there's plenty of content still coming. I'll see you next time. I don't want to die. You're not going to die. We're just going to talk. Nothing will happen to you. You have my word. Okay. I trust you. <laughs>